Hi, everyone. I think uh, it's 9 o'clock. Uh, we are good with time, and I think we can get started. Um, so I thank you all for coming. Uh, I, I really appreciate the nice response we've had, and it'll be exciting to see how this this first uh, virtual SFN uh, event uh, for me uh, really goes. Uh, today, we're going to talk about a workflow that we've been using to map uh, me brain measurements into a standardized reference space. Um, and with me on the on the line are Dr. Uh, renowned neuroanatomist, Dr. Chip Griffin, uh, and Dr. Brian Eastwood, uh, who is a computer scientist uh, with us at MBF. Uh, and myself, I'm Nate O'Connor, and I am a product manager for all things brain mapping at MBF. Um, just a little bit of how we're going to go today. Um, I'm gonna we're gonna um, Chip is going to take over at one point and give some real scientific context. Um, but I'm going to first go through uh, what this workflow is and a little bit about how we developed it. Um, with that, um, I'd say, too, there's a survey at the end. Um, we want to hear what directions you would like us to take with some of this product as well. Uh, so please, please fill that out. And there will be a Q&A at the end, too. And if we don't get to any questions, we definitely answer everything by mail. So uh, let's let's jump in and get started. So really, this workflow starts with something that's accessible to, to most laboratories, and that's serial sections. So if you're cutting brain, you, you probably have the ability to make serial sections, and you probably have the ability to image them um, and get whole slide images. So the workflow really starts with something that's accessible to most, most experimental laboratories. Um, we take and we assemble those serial sections, and we register them with respect to each other into a brain volume. We then make measurements in that. And here I've got an example of making um, cell, cell detection for two different populations. And then we bring that uh, and we wanna get those counts into a standardized reference space. Uh, and here that is the, the Allen CCF and uh, Common Coordinate Framework. And that actually includes their average mouse brain, which is over 1500 mouse brains registered um, and averaged um, from block phase two photon imaging. Um, and all of its ontology and its uh, delineations or its, its annotations. Once we've matched our experimental images in, into, that, um, into the CCF or into that coordinate system, we can start to accumulate them so that we can, we can tally all our results within a cohort, compare it to another cohort. If you look over to the right, I've got really, um, I've partitioned for this example all of the cells I detected by the various uh, uh, regions that are in the in the Allen Atlas. So really, one overview of this is um, is one important step of this is really registering a series of sections um, into that brain volume, going through that, finding a candidate that um, really has a, what we consider a good match. And what I've got here, I've got on the left one um, is my my brain volume that I registered my serial sections to each other. And then I've gone and I've taken a section in that brain volume and registered it to the Allen space. And this is the equivalent, the red line will always throughout the presentation indicate um, the, um, the equivalent section that we found in the Atlas. And you can see, we'll get into this more, but there is, um, there is a tilt to it. So you can imagine, um, I'll, I'll give some more examples of this and Chip will definitely give some really striking examples of this too. Um, but we find that best candidate, we get a good fit for that one section, and we apply that throughout the extent here, the rostral caudal extent that we imaged. Um, and what we found is that works better because of the moving parts of the serial sections, um, and they're imaged in 2D effectively. Um, we found that that's more appropriate than simply applying a full 3D transformation. So this, this series of series of registration transforms are established and you apply those to the measurements from each, each serial section. So there are a lot of challenges in, in neuroimaging these days. Um, one of them being we can image faster and at higher resolution and, and in more volume than we've ever been able to. Um, and so just data management is a real issue um, as well as data access even and storage. Um, so MBF has a new rendering engine that's, that's really uh, tackled that problem, uh, and we have that in other presentations. But with this specific workflow, 
we found a couple of experimental things that were really important. Um, one is that tissue blocks aren't frozen in a canonical orientation. Atlases are published in a canonical orientation. They also aren't, you also have an angle on the knife. So you always have this offset angle to deal with. Another thing that came right out was uh, tissue distortion that happens during uh, experimentation, namely histological processing, but mostly due to compression um, of the uh, of cutting with the knife. And here, here's a, an example that really uh, shows that. Um, on the top is my experimental section. And on the right and the bottom are the equivalent, but not fully registered, uh, because we haven't accounted for scaling yet, um, but the equivalent sections from the Allen average mouse brain. Um, and you can see right away the, the striking um, compression that happens in why I do cutting. What we found was that that was necessary. Uh, it was a prerequisite to getting a good registration to the Allen Atlas, namely calibrating for that and not including it explicitly uh, not relying on the automatic uh, estimation completely um, was, nece was necessary to calibrate that ahead of time. And so we said, okay, this is a calibration we know we have to do. Let's go and see how variable it is within a given laboratory. Um, and I will say a lot of um, everything at, at MBF Bioscience, we, um, all the products we put out, pretty much all the products um, have uh, standing behind them uh, NIMH funding. Uh, from the SBIR program. Um, and so we, we have a, a research program that helps us really establish um, things like this um, that, that really impact the product in the end. Um, I also, um, a lot of what I'm about to show you, we found a simple but impactful finding. Um, and I had a lot of this work done um, by interns. Pre-COVID, we had a really active intern program that um, for a lot of kids was their first experience in any kind of commercial research set setting or even commercial setting. Um, and I really, really hope to fire, I was involved in that heavily. I hope to fire that up again because it was, it was good for everyone. Um, but what we found for this one laboratory was for 10 brains um, that the scaling that we had to adjust in Y or that compression in Y didn't statistically change across brains out of that protocol in this laboratory. Why is that impactful? Because what it meant was we could put in the software a calibration that a lab does once and then never has to touch again. Um, and sure enough, uh, it varies from lab to lab. These are similar plots, these are line connected plots of a similar measure um, across different laboratories. So really, it means you have to do that calibration once for that, that, that knife artifact or the scaling artifact, um, and then you don't need to worry about it again. And that really directed, that basic research that we do ahead of time in this process really impacted um, what we put out in the product. So that was, uh, a pretty cool finding. Uh, and this just summarizes that, that varied from the Allen, you know, the aspect ratio of that squishing varied from the Allen mouse atlas and between labs, but that really the, um, the scaling adjustment is necessary, um, but is constant within a lab um, so far in our observations. The other problem that we really had to address, and uh, we addressed this in the transform estimates itself, um, so it's done with every, every match, is asymmetry while matching to a reference. Um, and Chip has some, some more examples of this, but if you look at this experimental section on top, you immediately can see that the, for instance, the hippocampus is much, much descended on the left side of this image than it is on the right side. Um, and uh, you can see that as well in the equivalent section from the Allen. But what I wanted to show here is again, that red line, you can see it's an actual plane. So the actual, um, equivalent section in the Allen Atlas is is, is a, a tilted plane with angle angular offsets in both X and Y, and we're able to accommodate for that. Um, this is this is evidence of that in that we matched that section to the experimental section, um, and, but that's a necessary thing to uh, to estimate um, because you can imagine if you're trying to flip through a paper atlas or even a digital atlas. Um, you're basically between images or between pages, and you have to build that uh, that that dimen extra dimensionality in your head. This this removes that problem. This addresses that problem. Um, so I want to jump in for a few examples now. Uh, Chip, um, you actually uh, this is your data, so I'm going to hand it off to you to talk. You should have mouse uh, mouse control as well, and I won't touch my mouse so that it doesn't make yours jump. Okay, do I have mouse, con mouse control? You sure yeah. do. So this is, this is uh, my name's Chip uh, Gerfen. I've um, 
been using this program for quite some time. Uh, and I want to back up a little bit and just go through that uh, this program, when uh, Nate had said that what we do is we take uh, coronal serial sections and it's it, uh, through the BrainMaker workflow that's part of this program. Um, that's where we can reconstruct those serial sections into the 3D volume. That's very important and that's an cool, um, you know, in a future webinar, we can go through all the details about how that's done. Um, then what I'm going to demonstrate now is the what Nate was describing was uh, how we register that uh, 3D uh, brain volume into the Allen uh, common coordinate framework. And that's done with the workflow, the section registration workflow. The first part of that, though, has to do with this atlas calibration. And that's where the aspect ratio is set up. And as Nate described, that's done basically once. And what that accommodates is um, adjusting the uh, X and Y dimensions of the experimental brain to approximate what it is in the Allen space. Now, we do that once, and what we found is that basically we uh, I did this like three or four years ago and haven't had to adjust it since. Um, so because, you know, each lab cuts brains differently and they ask, you know, the, the uh, compression that occurs in the different dimensions or how the brains are processed, hopefully it's pretty consistent within a laboratory, but it varies between laboratories. So that's why uh, there's this atlas calibration function that goes in. However, it doesn't have to be super accurate because um, it can be also adjusted when we do the actual, um, you know, for each experiment. And so we can adjust the scale, the X and Y dimensions um, in the scale. So this is the, uh, this, this is the window that comes up for the section registration. This shows the uh, particular section um, through that volume that we pick. And we can scroll through the volume using an ortho the orthogonal view viewer. And so this is about, um, this is the front of the brain and the back of the brain. And so pick the section that's about, you know, midway through the brain uh, where there's hippocampus and uh, amygdala, uh, fiber tracts that are noticeable. This is what we're trying to do is to find the, the section, the, the reference, the, find uh, where this section fits into the Allen space. And so this is the Allen uh, image of the Allen space in sagittal view and showing the cut through where this move can move that um, where we are in the Allen space by shifting in the z dimension. So if I move this this uh, scroll bar here, it will move the plane where we are located in the Allen space forward and backward. So what I found a place a comparable place in the um, Allen space that's pretty close to where it is. This is an overlay of the experimental brain and the Allen space. Uh, and we can um, adjust the transparency. So right now we're seeing more what the section is in the, uh, what it looks like, what the Allen space um, is because we've got the transparency set so that it shows the, more of the Allen than the, uh, than the experimental section. So you can see that the, in this section, the um, hippocampus um, is asymmetric you know, on the, on the right and the left. So mm -hmm. what we need to do is to adjust this uh, plane, this cut plane through the Allen space. And we can do that by ro rotating in the X and Y um, uh, axes. And so when we've done that, go to the next slide. When we do that, we see that this, um, this is the new cut that goes through the Allen space, and it has now aligned that to the experimental brain. So you can see that by, um, in this case, the hippocampus um, in the uh, in the experimental section is quite far rostral to the where the amygdala is relative to the um, Allen space, and so that's why this this uh, this plane is angled like that. And also we adjust for the right and the left so that the left side, which is more caudal than the right side, that's what this, this uh, plane shows. We can see that so the plane, can, go ahead. With this, it would, be, it would be quite a challenge if you had cell counts on this and we're trying to map them with a paper atlas to specific brain regions, right? Right, well, that's, that's the point is that, that you know, when you know, our, each individual section that we have experimental section when we try to look in the brain in, in, a, in a paper atlas, you know, 
it's often things like I said, which is, you know, the hippocampus at one level, um, for a given section, the hippocampus is at one level and the amygdala is at another level, uh, right. things like that. So what we're doing is equivalent, is the equivalent of that, um, trying to find what the plane is. And so that's what we've done here. Now you can see that um, the, uh, what I usually do is I go back with, I, because this is a fixed image, I can't do it, but I could change transparency so that we can you know, go back and forth between the atlas and the um, experimental section. Uh, here, the experimental section is shown in red. Um, you know, so this looks like it's a pretty good map. So what we want to do, what this program does then, is it takes this as a starting um, starting section. And then what we want to be able to do is to march through and apply these transforms to every section in the brain. The idea being that um, the offsets are consistent for any given brain. When, when we cut a brain, you know, frozen second, when we cut a brain frozen or however it's cut, um, the, uh, the angle of the brain, uh, it's basically how the brain is put into the cryostat or into the microtome or whatever. We never do it perfectly um, so that it's never completely orthogonal to the Allen coordinate space. And so what we're trying to do is to find what those offsets are relative to the orthogonal space that the that was used to create the Allen coordinate uh, system. Um, so what we need to do is to find and you know try to find the optimal um, offsets. And so I usually start in a section like this where it's in the middle of the brain where there are fiber tracks like the mammalothalamic tract, the hippocampus that are good markers for and the optic tracks um, that are good markers for where where the this part of the section is in the rostral caudal uh, dimension. Once I've done that, then I move, and you can go to the next uh, slide, Nate. Once I've done that, then I can move to a more rostral, to different parts of the brain to see how well the offsets match. Um, that offset that I match with that original section match with other sections in the brain in other, at other levels. And so here I've gone to a rostral area where the anterior commissure is crossing and the striatum and the dimensions and all. And so here we have the same, you can see the same distortion or same asymmetry between, you know, the left side of the brain is much caudal to the right side of the brain. And to see whether or not those transforms that we had, um, to see whether or not the trans the linear the transforms that we had applied to that prior section, uh, you know, also are appropriate for these other sections. Go to the next section. So basically what I do is I just go jump through, you know, different levels. Uh, this is an area where the septal area is just to see if those transforms are consistent or, and applied through that, um, um, you know, through all those sections, if that's, uh, if that's going to be appropriate. Once that's appropriate, once I determine that, okay, the, uh, angle that the offset that I've determined in the uh, X and Y dimensions are appropriate, then I run um, the program. And what this does is it, I run it through the whole brain and I apply, uh, apply those transforms first uh, in a linear, uh, as a linear transform. And what that does is it goes through and it just basically applies those angle offsets to every section and it marches through you typically we have 120 130 sections in there in our 3d volume and it marches through all of those and it applies that transform to each of those sections and that does, gives the first pass of registering our 3d volume our experimental 3d volume into the allen coordinate system and nate will show something a little bit uh, later but also then um after that this the first step just applies a linear uh, that's it in a linear fashion. Then we run a nonlinear fashion, a nonlinear transform. Um, and what that does is it uh, applies nonlinear transforms to each section. And that adjusts for, you know, things like distortions in the cortex, some minor cuts in the brain, um, sometimes when the, the, um, the uh, ventricles are enlarged or things like that. And it, it, uh, it applies locally to each section, a nonlinear transform. And then that, uh, those two, and it marches again through the, all the brain uh, and applies those. And at the, uh, the final output of that then gives us the registration of the, um, of the brain, of our experimental brain to the Allen coordinate system. 
what that does then is if we have counted or if we have marked cells, um, and I'll show examples of this later, when we mark cells uh, in the brain, then the location of those uh, detected cells throughout the brain then are transformed into the Allen coordinate space. Is there another slide, Nate? Oh, I just, you know, went through. This is just showing we're marching through different parts. And here, actually, the, the distortion in the cortex is shown uh, better, a bit matched. Yeah. Uh, right. Um, okay, one more. Okay, I'll throw it back to you, Nate. You can, um, and I'll follow up later. Great, sounds good. Um, and so just to point out the difference between some of the registration methods that we have and have researched and, and, and implemented in, in NeuroInfo, um, th this I thought was a nice example. Um, you can see that there's some, some indentation in the cortex, a flattening or indentation for some experimental reason, whether it's due to, I, I, I'm not familiar with this case exactly, whether it's due to- This was due to the, somebody, this was due to an injection into the somatosensory cortex. And so that often happens at injections, okay. some some uh, compression of the, or distortion of the cortex of the injection area. Gotcha, thanks, Chip. Um, and one of the things we first tried, of course, is a linear, um, a linear match to, to find the corresponding section in, in the, Allen uh, reference space. And um, we find an angle um, that looks somewhat appropriate, um, but you really, we can't accommodate for that injury and, or that, um, that indentation in the cortex. And it has a, 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 even an impact uh, broadly on the linear estimate that we, that we found of the transform. And it really impacts that side of the brain and even over here, dorsal to ventral. Um, so we, we, for a while, have also been Im implementing um, nonlinear methods, and if we do that, which can move things around well, more Nate, locally. That's what, I, Nate, that's what I described before, was that we first do the, the, the pass through with the linear transforms, and obviously you can see from the example you're showing is that it doesn't do a perfect match, and then right. the nonlinear supply. Refines that to get us to this space where we're able to accommodate that. Um, and. The idea too is, if you notice, as soon as that experimental section is in, is matched to the C, the Allen CCF or any uh, reference space that you happen to be using, um, you can immediately uh, delineate um, anatomies of, that you're interested in. Um, and they're just kind of done behind the scenes and you choose whether to show them or not. Um, so it really is, um, I just wanted to show another case where it, it's worth investigating um, um, the, the nonlinear methods uh, that are built into NeuroInfo, um, especially in cases like this, which are Chip uses it all the time, right, Chip? Yes. Um, the next thing really um, that we tackled in the past year um, is machine learning and hence enhanced cell detection. And so we, um, we went about um, saying, we have we have a we have a cell detector built into NeuroInfo. It's based on the Laplacian and Gaussian, and it's um, it's modified from that a bit. But if you look here, I'm gonna hit my highlighter quick. Yeah, if you look here, it it is good at picking up cell bodies, right? Um, oops. It's good at picking up these uh, these pyramidal cells in the cortex, um, but it's also really good just picking up other things as well. Um, and so what we did was set about to see if machine learning could help us. And um, Brian implemented and researched uh, convolutional neural networks for this. Um, and we taught it, really, um, Chip did a lot of clicking on cells to train this thing. We taught it over the past year and a half what, what pyramidal cells effectively look like. And so you start with this LOG detection result and then move on and apply your machine learning classifier and we've gotten really, really good at, at looking at, at, at being able to have the classifier know what pyramidal cells look like in the cortex. Um, and um, Brian, I, I ask you to chime in about how many images uh, have gone into training this network? Um, we used about uh, somewhere around 100,000 images, um, it, basically examples of, of cells and also examples of what are not cells, things that look kind of like cells. 
um, to our, our initial uh, detector, but um, are not actually cells. Um, right. So we have 90,000 images, and then each of those images also, um, we amplify that training set by randomization. We, add, we, we tweak each image as well um, during the training process. So we actually generate a lot more examples um, to, to then train the classifier. Cool. So yeah, a lot of work goes into getting uh, one of these to be successful. Um, and um, right now, we're expanding the number of classifiers um, that we that we can deploy. Um, so look for those soon. It would be interesting to know what types of things you would think uh, are 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 good candidates for automated detection. And we have that efforts in neuron tracing so, going on. Yeah, I want yep. you to go back to that image. Sure. Yep. And the prior one. Yep. And so I just want to emphasize how remarkable this is. Because <laughs> the flossing of Gaussian is um, that uh, that had been implemented or put into the program is, is pretty, it works pretty well. And on a lot of types of labeling, um, it's, it, you know, it does a good enough job or it does a very accurate job in terms of, of um, picking out labeled neurons. And, all. and then there are examples like this, where we've got lots of dendrites and processes and things like that, that the Laplacian of Gaussian just doesn't adequately distinguish between, you know, thick dendritic processes or thick axons from the cell bodies themselves. And so um, the implementation that Brian developed here, uh, and now you can switch to the next one just to show how remarkable it is that this is a little, little, this is what, you know, what ends up with the, um, the machine learning. You look through this image and you can just see that it's pretty incredible that it just it picked out you know cells that are um all the all the pyramidal cells and got and didn't detect the um or eliminated uh, a lot of the, the laplacian gaussian tagging of, of dendrites and things that are not right this is a remarkable um a remarkable process and uh as nate and brian have said that this is going to this is being expanded for other types of neurons you know, um, particularly FOSS labeling and things like that. FOSS should be, you would think, would be easier because it's just, uh, for the most part, nuclei. Um, and so that's one of the next uh, steps that's, that you guys are addressing. Okay, go ahead. And I just the want to emphasize that this is a really remarkable addition to the program. Yeah, thanks, Chip. And and this isn't just a straight up LOG two. We do have uh, filtering on things like trying to throw out things that are bigger or smaller than a certain size, and we threshold on the strength response. And oftentimes in a busy field, this is like the best you can get. So yeah, it is, it, thanks Chip, that is, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you jumped in there. This, is, this has been a lot of work and, and a real step forward. Um, and so really once we have these, these improved results, it's, it's, it's mapping them um, to the CCF and then mapping, once we have those transforms, that series of transforms here in the rostral the caudal extent, we can then partition them by the ontology, like I showed in the beginning. So this is this is kind of the the one of the endpoints that you can get out of this. Um, other things that we're working on and, and and we'll be including this year, and I'd really be interested in in feedback on um, uh, how applicable uh, to the community that would be is um, we have the ability to uh, register block face and clear tissue images to. Um, the Allen CCF, and we actually have been doing that for a while. We just haven't built it into the software yet, uh, but it's coming. Uh, we we do that. Um, it's it's a bit of an easier problem because you have natively three D three D data to begin with, um, and so we do a full three D estimation of the transform that matches us to the Allen space. This is an example of block based imaging, which is stacked together and then uh, matched. Um, but to keep in mind. We wanted to make something that was really broadly applicable in the beginning, and every lab has induced serial sections pretty much. Um, not every lab can conquer, um, you know, the hill that is clearing clearing methods and or have a light sheet image or appropriate confocal to image them, or certainly the block face two photon um, is its own unique animal. Um, so we so we wanted to make sure that serial sections were were addressed first because many many labs can can use them. Um, other things going on, uh, hopefully uh, quick this year, uh, is we want to improve things in brainstem. And um, so we're trying, we're, we plan to expand some of the work from Carton and Kleinfeld out at UCSD, where they actually, when you throw down delineations, they 
um, we could potentially enhance them with machine learning uh, and that their work is the machine learning. So you can imagine getting a match uh, with your serial sections to the Allen and then having the, the delineations updated by a machine learning. Uh, so that's some of the things future we in the future we have planned. I see questions coming in. Just a reminder, uh, that's awesome. We will have uh, questions and answer in the end, and I'm going to try to. Um, we're doing great on time, so I'm going to try to get to everything. Um, Chip's going to take over in a minute here. I just want to remind folks that there is a poster session. Um, it's, it's actually in about an hour. Um, if you um, if you look for my name, O apostrophe C O N N O R, um, I'm the Nathan. There are a few of us Irish people here this year, um, but it's if you search under author for O'Connor, you'll you'll find you'll find my poster. Uh, but it's P three seven six dot ten as well. Um, so with that, Chip, I am going to make you the presenter and let you run through um, your part of the presentation so that we can get some more scientific context for this. Are there any questions that should be addressed now? Yeah, I, I think that would be great. I'm making you the presenter, and let me um, let me expand my question page so I can see the whole thing. Um, can counting an optical fractionator workflow be automated? So that's a good question. Is a stereology question. We actually have a grant for that uh, called Fast Count. Um, it's a bit of a different workflow uh, where you're actually imaging in high resolution 3D in random spaces throughout sections and then applying machine learning um, um, to the to the those scans. Um, so yes, that is something that uh, we're actively working on. Um, and the second question I've gotten, um, someone also asked was the cell detection automated and it is, uh, it, it's fully automated. Um, someone asks, um, a lot of good questions coming in right now. Someone asks, um, is spine tracing and classification aided with AI uh, would be extremely useful. Um, it's interesting you mentioned that. We have, I believe, Chip, you know about this. We've just submitted a grant uh, with some collaborators for, for doing exactly that. Um, and for spines, for spines and um, for um, synapses, um, I'm sorry, my dog is barking. We have snowshoers going through our, our, our field in the back. Um, so if you hear if you hear a German shepherd bark, you know. Um, but we have spines and, and uh, synapse, or what we're calling uh, puncta detection, actually in NL360 right now, so a, a sister product to NeuroInfo. Um, so uh, the other one is, is the workflow limited to Allen's mouse atlas? Um, it is as released, um, but what we're doing is we're going to publish um, uh, a spec on how you would incorporate another atlas into NeuroInfo. Um, because we get asked about RAT, and um, another one that I've worked on recently uh, or starting to work on is, is field mouse. Um, so, yeah, so definitely uh, right now it is the Allen Mouse Brain Atlas, but in the near future, others will come and we'll publish a spec on that. That looks like the questions for now that I have. I'll, I'll hand it to you. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yep. We are. You're good to go. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, the spine detection uh, that's done. Uh, that's been I think uh, done well in the NL360 product. Um, so um, that is automated. And the cell detection is definitely automated. When we go through initially and do a cell detection, it, it actually goes through the whole brain. Um, and, uh, and even the, the uh, machine learning part of it, it takes about, um, can take, you know, depending on how many cells need to be, are detected. But I've detected, you know, in certain uh, experiments, um, you know, uh, <laughs> millions of, of neurons. <laughs> And that takes hours, but it, it's, you know, once you set it up, it just runs. So I want to give a little bit of a, a background and context to, um, you know, this approach that, uh, and it's um, in much, uh, you know, mainly in, in large part by the Allen Institute's um, <clears throat> Connectome project. Um, and this was a project that they, uh, that was done at the Allen Institute some years ago. And um, they, what the, if you're, I'm 
maybe most of you are familiar with that, but what they did was that they injected an AAV uh, viral vector that allowed for the uh, tracing of projections. And this, and this is one example, uh, injections into di different parts of the uh, brain, in this case, into the cortex, and then uh, labeled the uh, axonal projections uh, through the whole brain. And then they took the serial sections. In this case, it was block-based two-photon imaging. And, um, and uh, imaged it, and then uh, you know reconstructed into uh, their common coordinate framework. Um, this this was, to my mind, I'm a uh, long you know I'm an aging uh, neuroanatomist, and uh, this is just was a remarkable um, advance in the field because what it did was that it allowed for um, you know brain, uh, cases from thousand you know from a thousand brains. They use a thousand brains injected all over the you know, a thousand different structures in the in the brain. And it allowed for putting all of those cases and comparing between different cases into the single common coordinate framework. Um, and this it opened up just a different way of being able to do quantitative analysis of neuroanatomical connections that hadn't been possible before. And it was really a remarkable, wonderful breakthrough. However, one of the disadvantages is that you can see from their original paper that there were something like 35 authors on those. Um, and, uh, you know, a few like me that was uh, consultants, but, you know, for the most part, it, took, it was a big operation. It took a lot of people to do this and all. And so individual labs probably, you know, wouldn't have the resources or the ability to do this type of approach. And so what the NeuroInfo and the uh, MBF and, and others have done now is to enable individual, you know, to be able to take the same approach and apply it, um, you know, in individual labs. It is worthwhile, though, going through what the advantage of this is. So this is an, a, one example from one of their thousand uh, injections into the cortex. This is an example of. This is an example from. So from their, you know, the over thousand cases that they had in their database. Um, I was interested in saying, you know, one thing that one might be interested in is what's the uh, relationship is there of the topography within the cortex to the projections to the rest of the brain. And so I could just go into their database and pick five cases, and these are five separate cases, one case where there was an injection into the primary, uh, five cases into the primary somatosensory cortex, one into the mouth region, into the upper limb, lower limb, and two into the barrel fields, and then uh, combine them into a single uh, image because our uh, image because they're all in the same common coordinate framework. And so this is showing they could be rotated, and the brains could be sliced in all different directions. So you can see that um, all of these, you know, the projections from these five different um, cases can all be viewed simultaneously. Um, and then here, you know, showing sections through this, these are sagittal sections. And then I took coronal uh, slices through the different regions, through the rostral Stridum, caudal stridum, through the thalamus, and through the midbrain. So, what what we could see from that, and what one of the things that you could say is, that, okay, is the uh, relationship, the somatotopy or topographic organization within the cortex, is that matched in the projections to other parts of the brain? And the answer is yes, it is. But now we can actually visualize that. So these are uh, this is the relationship topography. Basically, refers to the relationship between structures um, and maintaining them. So here we've just overlaid the, you know, the, the relationship of those injection sites into the cortex. And then when we look into the, uh, their projections, the projections of those, uh, those areas into the striatum, uh, you get the same um, relationship. They're inverse, but they're uh, basically, there's a maintenance of the uh, topographic organization. Similarly, there's uh, the maintenance of the projections in the cortex to the, in their projections to the thalamus and even into the midbrain. So this is, I just put this up because this enables, you know, this is an example of how, you know, what's the utility of being able to map, um, you know, multiple uh, experiments into a common coordinate framework. And this is one of the examples. This opens up all sorts of uh, ways to do analysis. And one of the things that the Allen uh, people did was to say, okay, now we've got them all mapped together. Can we determine, you know, what are the relationships between different brain regions and do they fall out in some organizational pattern? And they, you know, use cluster analysis, which is a commonly used method to say that, yes, in fact, there is, you know, uh, 
neurons in different parts of the brain are actually organized in a way that uh, uh, is consistent with their projection patterns. So uh, now I want to just go through an experiment that's uh, ongoing with the uh, with Alexander Nelson's lab at UCSF in San Francisco. Um, a study uh, done by Ali Gersol and Mike Ryan with Alexandra. Um, and just as an example of how this, uh, you know, uh, how this can be used or how we use this software. Um, in this case, um, what we wanted to do was to map the, um, can, is this showing up properly, uh, Nate? Yep, you're, you're, you're good. Okay, so this is a case where uh, instead of mapping the anterograde projections of neurons, what we wanted to do was to map the, um, the, uh, the inputs to, in this case, D1 neurons in the striatum. So we used, there was a D1 Cree mouse that was used, and then uh, rabies was injected into the striatum, and then it retrogradely labeled uh, neurons in the um, cortex and other areas that projected the, the D1 neurons. And uh, so this is the uh, injection. You can see the, uh, you know, the rabies, the starter cells, and the striatum in the retrogradely transsynaptically labeled rabies neurons in the cortex and other areas. And then using the um, cell detection methods, the neurons were detected. And then going through the processes that I've described, they were then mapped into the Allen space. And so these are actually the detected neurons in the cortex mapped into the Allen space. So um, the, the Allen space um, is also divided up into, you know, some, I forgot how many, 2,500 different regions, structures in terms of, you know, in the cortex, the, all the different cortical areas, um, the, um, and these are mapped in, you know, so these are the structures that you can see that the, after the neurons have been mapped into that. And then going from, you know, rostral sections through caudal sections, um, can see the, the labeling are the neurons that have been detected in the different regions and the globus pallidus, uh, thalamic nuclei and all of that. Um, so, and as Nate has shown in other slides, uh, the data is then spit out into an Excel spreadsheet that actually has the number of neurons detected in each of the structures. So each of the different layers, are, you can view them, you know, in terms of the total number of neurons in the cortex, or the number of neurons that are in each um, subcortical area, different, you know, primary motor areas and all that, and even in the different layers. And so all of that data then can be analyzed. The advantage is that we can then uh, compare between um, uh, different uh, experimental conditions. So in this case, what we did, what was done was to compare the number of neurons in the cortex projected to the stridum in the D1 neurons versus the D2 neurons. Um, you know, and compare between the control number and after, you know, in animals where they had uh, been, uh, the doping system had been lesioned to create a Parkinson's model and uh, lesioned, and then the animals had been given L-DOPA. And uh, these are standard, you know, uh, models for looking at, um, at Parkinson's disease. And we can see that there was actually a decrease in the number of neurons that were labeled, um, you know, and it differed between in, in the cortex and in balance and other areas, but it differed between uh, the different conditions. So this is just an example of the type of thing that can be done, um, uh, you know, using as long, you know, what, since we can map uh, neurons that are detected into a common coordinate framework. This is just showing some more um, other examples of things. This is an example where we use rabies to label inputs to the, um, our neurons are projected to the periaqueductal gray versus the uh, basolateral amygdala. And, to, and this is a, actually a single case. And then the software allows, um, you know, allows you to look at it in uh, three dimensions. And this is a single case. And then what I actually did, what we did was we took four cases of each, you know, from each type of injection and then combined them into a single one. And you can actually see that there's, um, Pretty, it's pretty similar so that it enables us to look at, um, you know, uh, how an individual case compares with, you know, uh, three or four cases from uh, similar cases or different cases. This is another example where this was a, uh, where we took, um, where a single neuron was injected in, in 20 different cases in a uh, barrel cortex. Um, and again, each, this was the combined tracing of, uh, 
inputs to an individual neuron in the cortex from 20 different cases. And the method allows, um, uh, you know, to look at, uh, we can combine those images because it's all in the same common coordinate frame. I think that's about all I've got, Nate. Yeah, that's that's awesome, Chip. That really, um, the, the the ability to combine cases after registration is is really uh, it brought home by that. That's that's really cool. Um, we're doing great on time. Uh, I have some more questions that have come in, uh, Brian. I think this would be a good one uh, that you you and Chip together could talk to. Um, uh, part of this, I think, is on our roadmap for the year already. But I'll let you I'll let you chime in if you don't mind. Um, someone asks, um, I'm wondering after registration, is it possible to export the morphed Allen Atlas, uh, TIFF, et cetera, and have a random color assigned for each anatomical region? Um, yeah, so uh, Nate, as you say, it's, it's a great question. Um, we have, uh, we can certainly look at that for our roadmap as well. Um, right now, I will say in our software, we can label any anatomical region that's in the Allen Atlas um, and have that show up um, you know, as, a, as a label in the, in the data file to, you know, to outline that region um, in the data file. Um, but we could certainly uh, uh, use a, you know, we could transfer that, in, that information from the Atlas and, and label all regions. Um, one of the challenges with that is um, you know, the atlas is actually organized into a hierarchy of anatomic regions and so you have things like um you know the isocortex is a super region and all of the regions of the cortex are contained within it um, and so at some point um you know what's labeled in the allen atlas is actually all of the lowest level regions you know the smallest regions in the brain and then we can build up the the larger um you know enclosing regions all of the uh, annotations um, in the Allen Atlas, and so that so when there's that question of saying if we could randomly uh, color each anatomic region, the question would be at what level um, in the Atlas would you want to color all of the regions? But we can certainly uh, uh, look at at, uh, at doing that in the software for sure. Yeah, I think I think that's a good I think that's a good question, and that just you know it's, it's the ways that we can. We can um, uh, provide greater flexibility in terms of how the Allen uh, images are viewed relative to the data. You know, because yes. we run into this all the time sometimes when we've got different markers and, you know, we often will have like, you know, five or six different, uh, well, as many as 10 or 12 when we combine different cases. Um, and then there's a problem with match, you know, having a lot of different colored markers. Um, matching it onto a, an atlas that also has colors. Um, so, you know, if there's a way to build in flexibility for those, that, that would be great. And as Chip was saying, uh, and I brought the slide back up for an for, uh, impartial answer to this question. Um, we, we're color coding, um, our, our, you know, the cells are output into the Allen coordinate system and overlaying on their, on their volume, which is color coded according to um, various IDs in the uh, in the hierarchical ontology, um, but to randomize that would be an in a really interesting thing. But we could certainly use the the um, uh, the colors that are in the Allen Atlas as well. Pretty straightforward. Um, we've got another question. Um, to do the uh, to do the retroviral whole brain tracing, how ah this is a good this is a question that comes up a lot. So so Chip, what's the um what is the what is the thickness that you're cutting at? How many sections are required? What's the resolution for this particular workflow that's appropriate? Well, that's a good question. It's kind of the basic stuff. So we cut um, what we found is we cut all of our sections to 50 microns. Um, so around that range is pretty standard. Um, another thing I want to emphasize is that the advantage of this approach over even the Allen is that, or, uh, you know, is that uh, we use standard immunohistochemical techniques on these sections, which allows, you know, labeling multiple markers at the same time. Um, so we use 50 micron sections um, and all. And also often it's asked, how long does it take? Well, and this is my standard answer is it takes a half an hour to cut a brain. Um, it takes, oh. Yeah, it takes half an hour to cut a brain. It takes uh, the way that we do the immunist chemistry. We put the sections into uh, these wells that is 
uh, it doesn't take anything other than, you know, that's uh, trivial, they go overnight. The real slowdown is the imaging, and the imaging takes between, depending on how many markers we're labeling, takes between two and four hours per slide, and we typically have 10 slides per brain, so it can take two to three days of, of uh, imaging. The, uh, the resolution of the imaging, what we standard what we use in all of the images that I've shown, even the images when we do cell detection, is um, we use the 10x objective. Um, and we find that that's pretty uh, pretty adequate for most of the types of work that uh, we do. You can go to higher, um, um, yeah, but um, so we do 10x sections, and then we, uh, in the Z dimension on each section, we uh, image it between 5 and 10 microns per step. So each section then is um, each section is then imaged, uh, you know, with the Z, and then we collapse the Z into a single plane. Um, and uh, the processing through the software, um, you know, from start to finish, uh, when we do the 3D reconstruction, it's you know it takes about uh, 45 to an hour to do that, um, and then the cell detection depends on. You know, how many cells are being detected that it can take two to three hours. And the registration process itself takes two to three hours. That's all just computer time. That's not um, actual manual time. Right. So you can have scanning going while you're actually processing to get to the to the endpoint. Right, right. Um, yeah, that that that's a great, really practical question. Um, so we've got that. Um, so, so basically, it sounds like you can probably, from a processing standpoint, you can get through two or three brains a day, depending? Well, the way we look at it is that, um, yeah. like in, in my lab, we have two microscope systems, and um, actually with just two people, um, we can process four brains a week. Okay, cool. Okay, so that's, that's the, yeah, that, I guess that's the real useful metric. Um, someone asks, um, is the software available now? It is. Um, if you go to uh, our our website, um, you and you'll be getting emails uh, follow uh, follow up with that survey that I mentioned. Um, but if you go to our our website, there's a Neuro Info page, and you can even um, you can try it. You can you can try it with your data for free. Uh, the, that process is it's going to send you a link and say, hey, send me some data. That'll go to me, and uh, part of my team will. We'll go and, and process that um, as and then send you a result and a link to download the software and try it yourself. Um, I, I, I know that um, we get a lot of requests for them. And um, Chip, you've helped with quite a few of those, too, actually, personally, to get people yeah. acclimated how to use I'm, things. I'm open to I'm uh, happy to answer questions when people have those. Cool. Thank you for that. Well, we've got five minutes left, um, but we we are at we've covered a lot of questions uh, and a lot of a lot of material. Um, with that, I don't see more questions, so I think um, we can we can call it a day here. I really appreciate everyone attending. Um, it's been a really interesting virtual experience. We're all um, Brian's in Massachusetts. I'm in northern Vermont, as evidenced by my snowshoe intruders during the talk uh, and chips down in uh, Bethesda, um, down in uh, the NIH. Um, the, uh, oh, one other thing is, uh, yes, definitely please fill out that survey. We, we You can influence what we're up to, but also um, this will be available on our website in the webinar section. So we'll put that recording up there. Um, and yeah, thanks everyone for attending. And, and also, don't forget yep. that we're going to be doing um, webinars uh, on, you know, going through the process in much more detail. In particular, yep. I mentioned that. I, uh, I mentioned that in the beginning, but you're right, Chip. I wanted to reiterate that. Um, so this was an overview of the workflow, and what we're going to be doing in a series of, of either weekly or biweekly webinars is to um, really go into each each part of that, like we didn't even show you the brain maker part, workflow part of things where we where we register all those serial sections together. So um, I did have another question, um, which gets to the, just before I disconnect, I'll, I'll hit this one quick. Any plans to address human brain? Um, 
the thing there is is finding a digital atlas that we can we can register to that has appropriate resolution. Um, but as I said, we're going to be releasing a specification that would let an end user uh, incorporate any any digital atlas that they have access to uh, into Nero Info. That's that's coming this year. And thanks everyone. Goodbye. Uh, thanks everyone.